we don't have these many, this many people show up and we have 10 things on the docket. So this should be an interesting evening. And since we have so many people, we would like to keep your talking down to a mere whisper, please. Yeah, I'll wait till everybody shakes everybody's hand. No, it's okay. <clears throat> Good evening. The City of Peabody Zoning Board of Appeals meets tonight in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and other applicable laws. Tonight's hearing will be conducted in the following manner. The Secretary will read the legal notice or state that such a notice has been waived. If it is a continued hearing, we do not read the notice. All applications this evening will be heard in the order they were received in the city clerk's office. Uh, we have three this evening. The petitioner or the petitioner's representative will present the subject application to the board. The chair may limit the length of all remarks. At this point, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to explain this to you in terms that you'll understand instead of reading this and then going back. So this is how it works. <clears throat> we call you up um, either one, two, or three. You or your builder or your attorney will um, state his name and address for the record, and he will explain to us, or you will explain to us while you're here, why you're here. Now, remember that you're here for dimensional relief. You're here because you want a variance. You're not here to complain about your neighbor. You're not here to complain about the weather. You're not here to tell us anything other than why you are for or against whatever is being presented. Oh, that just went way, that just went way out of, out of line. L let, let's go back a little bit. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> You present why you're here, okay? What you want. You want a, a variance for a, a shed, for a deck, for a, an addition, whatever it is. And you give us all the reasons why. And then the board will ask you some questions. And at that point, I will then say, is there anybody in the audience to speak for or against? That's when you remember that you're here for your neighbor's dimensional relief. So if you are for the petition, your neighbor, you come up and you just say, you agree with, with why they're here, and that's it. That's really all you have to say. And you state your name and address for the record. If you are here against your neighbor doing whatever, stick to why you don't want the addition, or the deck, or the garage, built, not because they're noisy neighbors, not because they're dog box, not because their leaves fall in your pool. It's, it's dimensional relief. They need a variance. They don't have enough room to build what they want to build, and you have some concerns. At that point, the, you, the petitioner, can address your neighbor's concerns. The best the best petitions that come before us are when you have already spoken to your neighbor and you've ironed out all your differences. I don't know if that's happening tonight. Uh, at that point, the board can ask you some more questions. We take a vote, for or against. I say this every, every month and it is exactly true. This is the fairest board of most cities and towns around. However, not everything can get approved. Whether you approved or denied, there is a 20-day appeal period. Um, if you get denied, I'm very sorry, but you asked for too much. We do have zoning laws and ordinances that we have to abide by. Um, and, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, <clears throat> So, please don't speak from your seat. I say this every month also, and every month somebody decides that they 
want to say something from their seat. If it's that important, just raise your hand and come back up to the podium. State your name and address for the record. Please don't shout out anything from your seat. Okay, we vote. It's all done. And then you go home happy, I hope. The decision is then typed and filed with the city clerk. Once the decision is filed with the city clerk, you have a 20-day appeal period. Call or our clerk will explain it all to you at the end of <clears throat> your uh, approval or denial. In compliance with the open meeting law, this hearing is also being recorded by our clerk. When you're at the microphone and you state your name and address for the record, please speak clearly and directly into the microphone. And that, my friends, is it. So today, tonight, we are going to start with a continued application. So because it's continued, you won't hear about it. We've already heard it. And this is on... Um, <clears throat> Three Calumet Street, Mr. Attorney Kelty. Thank you, Madam uh, Chairperson and uh, members of the City of Peabody Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is John Kelty. I'm an attorney. I have offices at 40 Lowell Street in Peabody, Massachusetts, and I appear this evening on behalf of uh, 114 uh, Birch Street uh, Realty Trust, whose trustees are John Zerpolo and Sean O'Neill. Uh, this is a request uh, for a variance from the height requirement of 30 feet to provide for allowance of a height of 32.3 feet. Um, we are seeking no other variances. Uh, when we left uh, at, after the last meeting, <clears throat> we had said that we would uh, reach out to our neighbor, a woman by the name of uh, Linda Pesco, and we have done so. We met on uh, two occasions, uh, one occasion, uh, and then conversed on telephone, and we were able to, uh, by telephone and also through email, we were able to determine some concerns uh, that uh, our neighbor had with respect to um, the impact that our construction might have on her property. We agreed that we would um, remove a wrought iron fence and uh, install a uh, resin uh, white um, uh, vinyl fence. We've done that. We have also uh, had agreed that we would um, soften the lighting. Uh, in other words, we would replace the lights that were uh, already installed on the garage with another set of lights uh, that would be provided with uh, dimmers and um, an ability, uh, they would be motion, uh, motion uh, triggered. Um, that has been done. And we agreed that we would uh, install a black perforated pipe in a dirt swale trench area adjacent to the abutters wooden fence. The pipe, once installed, will be covered with crushed stone. The purpose of the pipe is to prevent stormwater from cascading onto the abutting property and to direct water downhill toward uh, Sutton Street. I tried to reduce um, our um, conversations to an agreement. Um, the, our neighbor was reluctant to sign the agreement. I had offered to uh, change language. Um, whereby, um, I don't know if you had seen some of the correspondence, but I know some of the correspondence between our neighbor and myself was uh, shared with the uh, clerk of the board. And uh, in the absence of a um, signature on this agreement, I would suggest that uh, we're more than willing to do the uh, one item that uh, is not yet done, and it's not done because of the weather, and I would circle it on this piece of paper and provide it to, to you as uh, a condition if the board would like to uh, place a condition uh, with respect to this black perforated pipe. Uh, if you'd like to place that condition on, uh, on a variance. Uh, we have um, looked again at the issue of how did this occur and the initial plan that was presented by um, Eastern Land Survey showed a certain amount of fill being placed on that side of the house so that the elevation would have been raised some uh, two or three feet. However, that would have uh, impacted our neighbor by making the grade change between uh, my client's property and that property um, 
uh, the PESCO property, it would have been uh, steeper and more onerous. As such, our excavator, um, John Karamis, who is here this evening, he um, did not fill, and um, we, were, we remained at grade. Um, the grade between our property and uh, the PESCO property is substantially less than it would have been. Um, we are now trying to uh, further um, prevent any kind of uh, water damage from occurring on our neighbor's property. And to that end, we're more than willing to add, um, add that condition about the black perfor perforated pipe in as much as that is the, um, that is the item that uh, has not been installed because of the uh, cold weather. Um, it will require a uh, pipe to be installed uh, on the ground. Uh, and uh, it'll be perforated, covered with uh, a grab, uh, crushed stone, and we'll collect water and bring it uh, away from uh, Ms. Pesco's property. And I'm happy to answer any questions th that you may have, and I could provide this language uh, to the board. I'll circle it. And uh, with that, I'm happy to, my clients are here this evening and we're happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, just through the chair. Uh, based on what I've reviewed here, Attorney Kelty, I don't see anything much different from the last time. So just for the purpose of the record, I guess I would just refer back to the comments I made at the last hearing, uh, which was the, I see this as a technicality issue uh, with respect to the grading um, as opposed to any kind of intentional act, which I believe was a, originally alleged uh, at the last hearing. So I, I'm just... I'm maintaining my position consistent with the last hearing. To the chair. Um, this is very, very difficult one. And, and to be honest with you, I've, I've had a very difficult time ascertaining how this happened the last time. And, and I still am in the same position that I am before. I, I am, I'm sorry. I, I, I can't believe that you can, uh, everybody I talk to says, Irregardless where your median grade starts, where your grade starts, where anything starts, all right, you cannot put a 30-foot house on a foundation that has the 30-foot height restriction. They bought a house 30 feet. You're going to put it on a foundation. You're not going to put it on a slab. So they knew, or they should have known, that it's not going to fit. It's not going to meet the zoning requirement. Yet they chose to put it on, and, and what gets me even further, it's a prefab. It was a prefab home. Had all the time in the world to look this thing over, make sure everything was in place, make sure all the measurements were right, make any corrections you could have made before you even put the house on the foundation, yet you chose not to do that. Now, you haven't proven to me in any way that you didn't know that this situation was going to occur, yet you chose to still put the house on. And that's a total disregard for the ordinance. I understand technicalities, I understand mistakes, but I don't understand total disregard for the ordinance. If this board ever got into a position where people can think, all right, just do what you want and we'll go there for forgiveness, then we might as well pack it up, go home. We don't, you don't need us. You don't need the zoning board. What do you need them for? I just do what you want to do and go get permission from somebody. So I really tried to find a way to say how this happened, find a reason that, was, that could satisfy me how this happened. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. I, I think it has to be bought into conformance. I don't know how you're going to do it. We mentioned a few ways that it could be done. Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. But that's the way I feel. I asked you to go talk to the neighbor and hopefully you can rectify it that way. You made an agreement, yet there's no signature there. You send us a document that you're gonna do all these things, and I'm sure you would have signed it, no problem, but she won't sign it. 
you know, you could talk to her a hundred times, but you can't convince me that this woman really feels that you've made an agreement here. We've seen some correspondence. We've heard that, you know, and, and I didn't even see the doc. Oh, we, he, I think I was blackmailed. <laughs> well, there's, there's no agreement there. There's no agreement there. The word was bribed. Bribed. Or and I like had that. offered to remove any offensive <laughs> language yeah, so and try to whittle down, and that's where communication uh, ended. But we still more than are willing to supply the things that we discussed that would prevent water from um, entering upon her property. And that's the reason, um, in order to avoid a severe grade change between our uh, driveway and the PESCO property, that's the reason that no fill was brought onto the property to raise that side up. It's the same box that's on um, two, of the other, uh, two of the other houses, and they do not exceed the uh, height variance because of the uh, elevation around the foundation of both those houses. And Can I just interrupt? Sure. Um, we understand all of this, and like Barry said, this has been very difficult to try to figure out. However, when there is a zoning requirement, height requirement, and it's a prefab, and there's a foundation, then personally, I would think that the builders would take a whole wide look at this and say, whoa, you know what, I think we're going to need a variance. So you come to us before, you don't come to us after. Because as Barry said, then what is it? Then what, what is the zoning board here for? Oh, okay, you, you want to go build a house? You want to go build a foundation? You want to go build a deck? Build whatever you want and then come to us because, oh, well, it's already built. What can we do? And I know it might seem melodramatic, but in reality, that's, that's what it comes down to. You, you, there are laws. This is not a 16-year-old a, a -ti first-time builder. The height requirement is the height requirement. You knew it. There's, look, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to say I knew you knew it. All indications are you knew what you were doing. You, you purchased a prefab, you knew the height limit, you built it, now you're asking for a variance. That's not the way this board works. You ask for a variance beforehand to see if you can build it. At, at the risk of, of doing back and forth and back and forth, I, I get that, <clears throat> but at the same time, they, they did come before us for a variance. And the house, even though the house is 32.3 feet, and I get what you're saying, Barry, with respect to that, but it's the, the height of the house didn't change. It was the grading that changed. So I, yes, it's 32.3 feet high, and it should be 30 or less, but it wasn't, I, don't, I look at it a little bit differently, so it wasn't as if they came to us with a, a plan for a house yay high and then put a house that was this high. The height is still the same. It's just because they didn't grade the front the way they said they grade it, I just I see it as a technicality. I know I might be the minority on this here, but I don't see it as a, as a I, I don't see it as one of the ones from you know several years ago where there was just a total disregard uh, to a plan. I think they followed the plan. There was just a grading error on the front end, but I I don't see it quite as severe. But it's still it's a problem. But I just see it as more technicality than anything else. Okay. Yeah, just my opinion. Through the chair, uh, Attorney Kelty, could you? You mentioned there were a couple of other houses that were the same prefab 30-foot uh, box on a foundation that didn't require a variance. But I guess I, I, I thought if you had a 30-foot box and you put it on a foundation, it was going to be more than 30 feet. Um, but is that not the case, depending on the grade? The box itself is not over 30 feet. The box itself is not over 30 feet. So in the other instances, the two that are down on uh, Sutton Street, um, because there was no, um, there was not the grade change such as we have here on Calumet Street, which is where on the side of a hill, the left-hand side of our house or the southerly side of the house is at an elevation of some 50, 50 odd feet. And then the slope 
if you will, runs through the house and when we do not fill the garage side of the house so as to keep the grade change less severe between us and the very next piece of property, uh, that's what results, by not bringing that grade up, that's what resulted in the um, uh, resultant uh, height being in excess of uh, 30 feet. So in those other two examples, does that mean that the foundation for those other two are below grade? The foundations are, well, yeah, all Entirely of the foundations. Entirely below grade? Huh? No part of the foundation sticks up above grade? And the other two no, examples? the box itself is not in excess of 30 feet or 30, even at 30 feet, the box itself, the house. Okay, so the house, the subject house. Yep. How tall is that? I thought you told us at the last hearing that it, you ordered, a, or your client ordered a 30-foot house. But maybe I misunderstood. Is that not the case? How, what's the height of the box itself for this, for this house at 3 Calumet? From the ground to the peak? Yes. 30 feet. Pardon? John, come up. This is uh, John Zerpolo. How you doing? The actual height of the box is, is less than 30. And to be understood, we weren't trying to pull a fast one on anybody. What John, what John Karamas was trying to do, he's our site guy, he was trying to keep the neighbor next door, Linda, happy. He didn't want her to be looking at a, a literal cliff. 12, and 13, it would have been 12 to 13 feet, and the water mitigation would have been impossible. So he lowered the grade. He didn't build up the grade to where it was supposed to be. If he did, we were well within the, the mean grade. So what we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is it really isn't a height, the height of the building, it's the grade is too low. And the reason why we lowered the grade was to mitigate the water and her not to look at a cliff. And she was there the whole time. John was there with an inspector that, that's no longer with the city anymore, a guy, Ron. And he, he, with her and Ron, they watched water go down and she was fine with it. Is there anybody in the audience to speak in favor? Is there anybody in the audience to speak in opposition? Well, at this point in time, the matter is before the board. Motion to close the public hearing. Uh, motion to approve. Call vote, please. No. 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 Number two, uh, 13 Granite Road. Notice is hereby given that the Board of Appeals of the City of Peabody will hold a public hearing on Monday, January 27, 7 p.m., Wigan Auditorium, City Hall, 24 Lowell Street, Peabody, on the application of William and Jeannie Delp for variance from the provision of the Zoning Ordinance 2019 as amended Section 72, as it applies to the premises known as 13 Granite Road, Peabody, Map 120, Lot 18. Petitioner seeks a variance to the side yard setback where 7.5 or 7.5 feet are proposed. The property is located in R1A Zoning District. This application and plan are available to the public and can be viewed at the City Clerk's Office and Board of Appeals Office City Hall in advance and prior to the public hearing. Good evening. My name is William Delp. My wife and I have owned the property at 13 Granite Road uh, for the past 52 years. And would like to put a small 12 by 14 addition on the back of the house, which is actually set back a foot further than the house from the property line, to include a, a new bedroom. And we're going to convert the existing bedroom into a laundry room and bathroom to get the laundry, everything up on the first floor. <clears throat> Uh, 
questions? Anybody in the audience to speak in favor? Anybody in the audience to speak in opposition? The matter is before the board. Motion to close the public hearing. Motion to approve. Roll call vote. Yes. Yes. All set. Number three. This is, yeah, this is uh, 151 Andover Street, and um, Ms. Picardi has something to say. Through the chair, I need to recuse myself from this matter. Thank you. So who is representing, right, who's representing 151 New, okay, so you know that you need all four votes to, to pass tonight, because there's only, there's four of us, Julie has just recused herself. Got it? Notice is hereby given that the Board of Appeals of the City of Peabody will hold a public hearing on Monday, January 27, 7 p.m. Wigan Auditorium City Hall, 24 Lowell Street, Peabody, on the application of LCI Management Care of Attorney John Kelty for a variance from the provision of the Zoning Ordinance 2019 as amended Section 7296 as it applies to the premises known as 151 Andover Street, Peabody, Map 52, Lot 17X. Petitioner seeks a variance from the front setback where 50 feet are required, 30 feet are proposed. Parking minimum rear setback where 50 feet are required and 40 feet are proposed. Properties located in a BR zoning district, the application and plan are available to the public and can be viewed at the City Clerk's Office and Board of Appeals Office City Hall in advance and prior to the public hearing. Packets that are consistent with what our engineer will be presenting on the boards, but these are just smaller versions of that same thing. So it's not something incredibly new. Are you going to present or are you yes, waiting? Uh, good evening. My name is John Kelty. I'm an attorney. I practice law at 40 Lowell Street in Peabody, Massachusetts, and I appear behalf, uh, on behalf of LCI Management Care of Eric Loicano of 18 Sargent Street in Gloucester, Mass. Uh, the property is owned by Brian D. Kelly. Brian is here this evening. Um, uh, if board has questions for Brian, my client uh, is here this evening, and uh, as well as our engineers. We have uh, sought a variance for a uh, proposed 50, 30 foot uh, front yard rather than 50. 
and we're proposing uh, that uh, the parking area adjacent to the residence district in a BR zone, the applicant desires to continue to be within 40 feet of residence district where 50 feet is now required. In 1993, uh, the parties that owned the property at the time uh, had put the property under agreement and they were intending to uh, build a board of books. Um, they were given a permit by the city of Peabody City Council. That permit requires that any change in use, uh, whether it be for an allowed use or uh, otherwise, must need go before the um, city council. And this matter will be uh, before the city council uh, in during their February meetings. We are requesting uh, two, um, two bits of zoning relief both of which are consistent with the original development of the property. When uh, prior to the development of the property as Board of Books, uh, there were, I think, as many as three houses on that corner. Um, the then um, applicants had brought the matter to the City Council uh, before the houses were demolished. They established what the front yard uh, what the front setback of those houses was, and then they um, filed a plan that gave zoning relief from a special permit um, through the city council. Um, I'm not going to speak to whether uh, that was appropriate, um, but I would speak to the issue that we intend to uh, maintain those same setbacks, both as to the parking at the rear and as to uh, the front setback. We are going to uh, add uh, 190 by 192 by 90 addition uh, to the premises, which, uh, as you can see from the renderings that we have here this evening, it will be exactly uh, the. Uh, it'll, it'll have all appearances. It'll be an extension of the exact same building that's up there. Uh, sitting there now, we will use brick uh, and materials uh, that emulate uh, the existing uh, building, which uh, I feel is a handsome and a good addition to that corner. We feel uh, that this uh, this particular property will also uh, the this addition will also uh, work with respect to uh, creating a, a bold and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, aesthetically pleasing. Uh, addition to that corner. I have had the opportunity to hear from neighbors. I did write a letter. Um, I was intending originally to uh, have a neighborhood meeting, uh, which would be run by uh, Councilor Matsoulis. Uh, Councilor Matsoulis had some concerns um, uh, that took him to the uh, hospital. He had some health issues taking him to the hospital. And uh, I then uh, sent a letter to the um, to the neighborhood uh, in which I explained what my client was trying to do, how big the addition was, um, the design that would match the existing design of the former Board of Books building. There is no additional curb cut being sought. I do have some familiarity with uh, this particular parcel of land, and I know that over the years there has uh, been a concern that, um, uh, that uh, when people miss the entry into uh, this board of books. Um, they invariably try to get in from Loris Road. They travel down, find that there is no ability to get back into the property from the rear. I had worked with uh, some, I think they were pediatricians who wanted to add uh, a rear entrance. Uh, that would not fly with the neighborhood. Uh, neighborhood uh, does uh, have a genuine concern about parties that miss uh, miss the entry. We are now going to not utilize the curb cut that uh, is currently used for um, the Kelly property and is currently used as the entrance uh, to the center of the property. That um, our addition will actually uh, negate the ability to use that, uh, that particular entrance. And then we're adding a, an entrance uh, on the left-hand side, which will be the only uh, entrance and exit uh, to the premises. 
we have um, we are going to regrade to the left of that entrance such that uh, there is parking over there that will be abandoned um, and then that'll become um, regraded and there'll be a grassy uh, uh, slope that will go down to Loris Road uh, there will no longer be that parking that uh, we, we showed uh, showed as an existing condition. We are also uh, proposing not to utilize uh, certain uh, parking areas that have been available in the past. We are going to um, store snow since we have um, no, um, no need for nearly as many parking spaces as uh, Mr. Kelly uh, needed to store cars and as uh, were required by Board of Books. So we have uh, considerably more uh, parking than we are uh, in need of. We have uh, provided you in your packet a response to the, um, we've provided a response to the uh, concern uh, exhibited uh, by Conservation Commission and we've given an executive summary as um, part of the package that I gave you this evening. Uh, and at the back page, that describes um, that describes uh, what we'll be doing with our stormwater. We're essentially emulating uh, the uh, same pattern uh, that was adopted years ago, and we will uh, um, we will uh, mimic uh, that use of uh, uh, that use of the uh, stormwater drainage that's uh, in place, and we will um, be. Um, we will actually reduce uh, the paved areas and replace uh, in certain areas uh, the paving with uh, uh, with um, um, landscape. And as such, uh, we were also discussing uh, that there be no landscape placed from our driveway heading westerly towards uh, uh, there would be no uh, kind of significant shrubs that would block sight distance if you're coming out of uh, Loris Road. One of the concerns that has been repeatedly um, um, uh, exhibited is that the um, neighbors are concerned that when they leave Loris Road and they're heading up to Andover Street, they're concerned that when they look left, are they going to be able to uh, be able to see the oncoming traffic, or are we going to have um, uh, are we going to have a large number of trucks that would be blocking uh, that site distance? And our response to that is, uh, no, we will not have uh, those trucks. Those, if there were any, usually the common, uh, my client operates two other facilities. The common occurrence is that uh, the largest truck that uh, usually um, comes to the site is a box truck like a 15-footer. Uh, we seldom have a large like, uh, Wakefield or Mayflower, the tractor trailers uh, dropping off furniture to uh, one of these facilities. Uh, we will um, be um, loading and unloading at the rear of the premises. Uh, there's a loading dock that shows on our plan, um, which is approximately, yeah, I think. Yeah, so all the loading uh, for the uh, people that are uh, utilizing the premises will all occur in the rear. There would be uh, office uh, availability on the left-hand side of the premises. There are several spaces going to be allocated for people doing business with the office. Otherwise, that traffic comes from 114, heads down the driveway. There is a gate at the bend that will be a key card uh, entry um, in order for you to be able to access uh, the rear of the parking lot. In order for you to be able to access the building, you've got to get through that gate, and that'll, that'll be key card entry. Um, we have a... The expectation is we will have a total number of units uh, that is 500 and 780, 780 units. Um, your floor plans that have been uh, given to you this evening show the uh, mix, how many are, si are of each variety of sizes that are being uh, offered. And um, I'm happy to answer further questions uh, that the board may have as they come up. Thank you, Jack. <clears throat> um, I have a couple. So coming up Loris Road, aren't there lights there? 
So if you're coming up Loris Road, you have to take a right onto yeah. Andover Street. Or go straight across. Or because straight there's a light, across. you can get it to the eastbound lane. So, um, and, and I think, yeah, you, you don't want to have any shrubbery or, or to block no. that. But Correct. it's it, it's not, um, if something were to get overgrown for a week, at least there's lights there, so it's not that much of, I mean, it's an issue, but you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure that... I, but I, um, one of the concerns expressed is that when you're exiting Loris Road, yep. now you need to, you're coming from a lower level, yep. now you need to head up that um, uh, entryway to Andover. Yep. And because you're heading upwards, your sight distance does improve. Although I have been told by neighbors that uh, there is concern that... Um, you got to be a little bit uh, cautious uh, well, yeah, inching out there. Even right. if you have the total green light, uh, you've got to. Well, there's always that somebody that you know is in a hurry. Runs the light. Uh, loading and unloading what? Uh, materials that you are going to put in your private storage facility. Oh, so um, it looks very pretty. Um, I just am a little ignorant to the fact of a storage unit because to me storage units are you know garage doors orange they open up I, I don't I don't see that is that what these are no. oh do you want to speak a little louder please microphone? that's tantamount to am I the only one that doesn't know what a storage unit is you can walk the mic over if you, oh. if, if you need to, if that would be easier for you. Wonderful. Uh, for the record, my name is Andrew Graves. I'm the principal of BL Companies. We're the uh, engineers and architects who designed this project for the client. Um, the way these facilities function, I'll walk you quickly through a floor plan, just explain how it works, and then I'll uh, address the question specifically. Not at a loss for storage space, are we? No, we're not. Actually, this is a much smaller uh, building than we typically build. Most of the buildings we build usually have uh, 1,000 to 1,200 containers. Uh, but per the ITE manual, this is the lowest traffic generating use you could possibly put on this site. The industry standard is one parking space for 100 containers. So a facility that has under 800 containers, 800 contain less than 800 containers, we typically would provide only eight parking spaces. Right now, the retail facility now has, I'm not sure exactly how many spaces are out there, but this would generate a fraction of the traffic that would currently be used if borders were still operating on the site. So from a traffic point of view, it's, it's minimal. Uh, loading occurs at the rear of the site in a loading area, and it's not a loading dock. It's like the entry to a pharmacy. It's bar parking glass doors. 60 to 70% of the people who store here are residential customers. They're typically coming in pickup trucks, minivans, or their cars. Uh, the other 30% are commercial people storing papers. Uh, the site is designed to handle like a 30-foot box truck. Maybe one or two times a year you may get a moving van, but that's very rare. M majority of the, the, of the, of the, of the traffic is, is small residential people and vans and an occasional box truck, a small box truck. Uh, again, this is the lowest traffic generating use you could possibly have on this site. Again, only eight parking spaces. Uh, so the way the site would function is that people would come uh, to rent a, to lease a container, stop at the office, there's three or four spaces out front. Uh, that once they lease the, the, uh, the, part, the uh, container, then they would come to the rear of the site. Put the site plan back up. Oh, I'm sorry, I covered. So typically when people are first uh, entering the site, they're coming here in a small vehicle just to lease the container. And when the large truck comes, it has this large queuing distance back to the gate. So there, there would not be any need for trucks to back or stop near the office area. Again, the office area is simply when you're leasing your container. When they come in, they have this large queuing distance for the truck to pull in. There's a keypad here, they enter, and then all the loading occurs back here. So we're putting a pair of freight elevators here that service both the existing building and the new building. 
Uh, because storage, we're doing a four-story building here, but because the storage buildings require very little mechanical and infrastructure above the ceilings, we can build a 10-foot, eight floor to floor. I think the borders is like 14 feet, so we can actually put four stories in here, and the height of our new building matches the height of the existing building. So again, all the storage is inside the building. This is not your typical mini storage with small oil doors, these cheap metal buildings. This is a nice a brick veneer masonry building that's gonna match the facade of the existing building. Uh, when you uh, enter the lobby, there's a, a place for your carts here, freight elevators, and then you go up to the upper floors and store your containers. All the roll-up doors are in the quarters inside the building. Okay, so let me get this um, straight in my mind. So you, you go around with the key pad, the gate opens, and that's how you get to whatever it is to get into the building? Yes. And in that building are all the storage units? Exactly. And, oh, well, that's a new concept, for me, anyways. Through the chair, is, is there any trash generated from a storage facility, and is that a, a concern, and if it is, how might you deal with that? Uh, very little, it's not any more than an office building would generate. Typically, we have a small five-yard dumpster. Uh, they don't want to put a big dumpster there, otherwise people use it as a place to throw stuff out. Simply people store their stuff there and they take their stuff and they take it away again. So there's very little, there's a 1,200 square foot office. A 1,200 square foot office generates very little paper. So there's very little trash generated by the, by the facility. What about lighting? Um, again, we sort of defer to the neighbors. We don't want to make it any brighter than they have to, but we still want to make it bright enough so it's, it doesn't place, become a place where it becomes a nuisance. But because Part of the whole storage, uh, self-storage facility thing is they want people to feel secure and safe. So the, the back area would be, be fully gated and controlled, and we'd probably put whatever lighting, again, we'd comply, there'd be no off-site spillage of lighting, obviously, but we'd probably light the parking lot, probably better to light from the far side towards the building than put building lights towards the building lighting towards the, towards the neighbor, so we would. Well, I, I mean, I, I I'm not a big fan of wall packs. I think actually posts here are actually probably more attractive and they would direct the light. Again, LEDs are very directionally functional. They, they don't put light in any direction, but where you, where you send it. So it would probably be better to light this way to minimize the spillage. But whatever the neighbors feel comfortable with, uh, again, we just want to make it feel secure and safe for everybody's sake, for the neighborhood's sake. Now, are these things open 24 hours a day? No. Oh. Uh, typically, they're open from 6 to 7 in the morning to probably 10 in the evening. The office hours are typically like 8.30 to like 6. I don't know. So if I have a keypad and, and, and it's 1 in the morning and for whatever reason I have to get to my storage unit, can I do that at 1 no, in the morning? No, you cannot. Oh, you No. You cannot open 24-7. No. Attorney Kelty begs to differ. of the property or my no, address? address. Eric Liacono, uh, 18 Sargent Street, Gloucester, Mass. Um, so the other facilities I have are open 24 hours yeah. a day. Yes, they are. We plan on having this one the same. So, so anybody, no. Is that on? So I yeah. asked if this was open 24 hours a day and you said? Yes. Okay. So, if this is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, does that present, or has it presented a problem in your other properties, and if so, what kind? The, the, hardly anybody comes there after nine o'clock at night. We say that we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The majority of the traffic is during the days, uh, eight to five usually. Uh, you have a few people that come after work, you know, after five, because it's easier for them to get get out their stuff later in the day. Um, we keep track of who comes in and out of the building through the, the keypads that they use. You have security cameras have, all around. And we have security cameras all around. We just did one in Beverly, and we have 81 cameras around the whole property. So we know, <clears throat> excuse me, we know who's coming and going at what time. 
Uh, whenever we see there's uh, someone's using the same key code more than once in, in consistently, we check to see on the camera who it is and what they're doing in the building. So and we do that every week. You know, this is totally from my own personal knowledge. So he has a key card and he, it's, I don't know, it's dark, 10, 10 at night, and he does it and the gate opens and I just happen to be lingering around with my car. I don't know why. Is there enough time for somebody to sneak in? And I know that's a stupid question, but. Is that every time? Which way does the gate yeah, work? It's 10 seconds. So you don't, you don't have enough time to, you, the person putting the code the in. The safety issue. Correct. Oh. Through the chair to Attorney Kelty. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if you really need to be here, to be honest with you, because dimensional, really, dimensional controls have been set by the special permit. It's a condition of the special permit. It's all dimensional relief has been that has been requested by the applicant, which is you. Well, why are you here? Uh, because the addition uh, was not covered by that original building. So in 1993, when they gave those dimensional relief, they weren't necessarily giving dimensional relief for the addition that we're talking about tonight. Okay. That's why so I'm So you're here. just at seeking relief for the addition? It's exactly right. And then we're going to go to the city council for right. the change in use, but this is actually an allowed by right use, as was the bookstore. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, so on the uh, left-hand side of this building, the side that abuts Loris Road that was or still is parking, a parking area, yeah. y y that's, you're doing away with that and you're going to landscape that? Okay. Okay, they, they want me to stop talking. <laughs> Anybody in the audience to speak in favor? If we have a multitude of people speaking in opposition, you all will have a chance to come up. However, if the first 10 people have said what you want to say, you can just come up to the mic, state your name and address for the record and say, I, uh, I oppose this for all the reasons that the first 10 people said, we really don't want to have to, we don't need to be redundant. And if that's the case, please name an address for the record so our clerk can make sure she gets it. And anybody in opposition, now you may now come up. I know. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Haley Ventura Wilson. This is my husband, Sean Wilson. We reside at 3 Reynolds Road. Um, we've been there for close to five years now. Um, with us here is our wonderful neighborhood. Uh, we have a Butters that are here with us that also are on the same side of Reynolds that we are. We directly abut the 151 Andover Street property. But we also have our neighborhood that makes up Loris Road, Reynolds Road, Blake Street, Tammy Lane and Northfield Road, 92 homes in that neighborhood. Uh, we love where we live. We absolutely love our neighborhood. We've come here today um, speaking in behalf of all of the neighborhoods. No? Just for me? Okay. Um, we've come here today to state that we are absolutely 100% opposed to the zoning board approving the variance request for 151 Andover Street. We also have with us Councillor Gould, who is in support of us as well. Um, when we moved to this property, we were told that this was approved for a bookstore only. Uh, we've always been aware that it may sell. We didn't know, you know what it would be. Um, but we were under the impression that the existing building would be the only building at that location. LCI management is asking you to add a second building, which will be four stories, 192 by 92 feet, which is larger than the property is zoned for. 
By approving this, you are allowing the construction of a major building directly in our backyards. You are also approving that this building that does not fit in the approved zoning space will be squeezed in and will come back further and closer to the property as well as closer to Andover Street, which is also known as Route 114. This giant building, per attorney John Kelty, will operate 24 seven. It will tower over our property. It will also be providing hundreds, and I believe you just stated 780 people with storage space that will be utilized from the back of the building, which is exactly our property line. A business of this size and operation will directly impact the abutters' daily lives. It will lower our property values, and honestly, it will be a complete eyesore entering into our neighborhood. Another concern we have was something that you did mention, Mr. Kelty. Um, it's about the light at the top of Loris in 114. Every person here and the neighbors that were unable to make it will tell you that on a daily basis we risk our lives crossing that intersection. Everyone here has had to slam their brakes on or been hit or practically hit at that intersection. Um, <clears throat> the only way in and out of that area is Loris into our neighborhood. By adding that giant building, it will obstruct our view of getting up and out of our neighborhood, but more importantly, it will obstruct the view of the people on 114 seeing us sitting at that light. Every day, multiple times a day, people blow through that light doing 50 to 60 miles per hour. It's frightening. On May 24th, 2018, Salem News published an article stating that per the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, Route 114 is among the top 200 crash locations in the state. In 2017 alone, there were 177 accidents on Andover Street and Route 114, according to the PBD police. I just lost my place. Um, that's about 15 accidents per month. PBD police stated that there are more accidents in this tiny stretch than there are on Lowell Street, which is double the size of our tiny stretch. Loris Road intersection is listed under the top five high crash intersections of Route 114. Now add the addition of a second four story 192 by 92 foot building in our view, as I stated, will be obstructed leaving our neighborhood, and the view of the oncoming traffic will be obstructed as seeing us leaving our neighborhood. It's of serious concern to me as well as the neighbors. You've stated that you're going to change the entry point for the new building from the current location to closer to Loris, but you're going to raise it? You're not going to raise it? I don't understand how that isn't also of concern, people coming even closer, not seeing that light. 780 units, there's a chance of 100 people showing up in a day for all we know. I listed some of the genuine concerns about this variance request, but most importantly, I want to reiterate that they are trying to squeeze a building that is just much too large for the space into a property that directly abuts residential homes that will operate 24 seven with lighting that when left on right now with Kelly Automotive, if by accident, literally my home, Al Gralia's home, our homes light up like a snow globe. And Mr. Kelly's great about shutting those lights off when I send the email, but now we're talking about a business that will always operate with lights on. I don't care if it's one person at one in the morning once in a while. This is our home and where we live. We shouldn't have to deal with that. We are strongly opposed to you approving this variance. Again, this will directly impact the abutters' homes, the daily lives, and I see adding this additional 192 by 92 foot building as a complete safety risk for all traveling along Route 114 as well as us leaving Loris Road. I thank you guys for your time. We thank you for your time and for listening, and I don't know if you have any questions. <laughs>
Hi, good evening. My name is Mike Soper. I'm at 16 Reynolds Road in Peabody. That drawing of the building that's going on there, I think, is very misleading of what the property is going to look like. The current Borders Book building is off to the far side, right off of the exit ramp coming on to 114. This proposed so-called addition is probably three times the size of what that, ad that original building is. I remember coming here 30 years ago, or whatever it was, and the neighborhood made concessions because Borders Books wanted variances to put that building up on that particular property. So the footprint was extended at that time to give them a larger footprint. Now, this proposal wants to give it even a larger footprint, both back and front. I don't understand it. I don't understand the whole concept why all of the loading and unloading and the traffic pattern has to be in the back of the building near the abutter's property. I don't know how close once this variance is granted, if it is, and I hope it isn't, how close is the building going to be? And the loading docks, how close are they going to be to the abutter's property? What's going to happen with snow plowing? What's going to happen with drainage? Why can't, if this is going to be approved, why can't some of this be shifted to the front of the building for loading and unloading and all that kind of stuff and entrance. Why is it all going to be in the back on the neighbor's side? I just, you know, I don't understand the whole idea. I think it, the building looks beautiful on, you know, in that drawing, but I think it misrepresents the whole area. You know, in behind there is a nice oasis. It's a residential area. The building make it, makes it look like it's an industrial area. It's not that. I sure hope that people consider that this is going in to a residential area, even though it's on 114, and hope something can be reconfigured to the back of that property so that people aren't getting dumped with uh, snow and drainage problems and all that in the back of the building. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hi, Leandra LeClerc, 9 Northfield Road. Um, can I just ask for clarification about the grading on the side with the parking? So right now it was mentioned that, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the property, but the way it goes down to a parking lot, and something was mentioned about raising that grading, which would bring another concern with visual, with traffic, and also would that grading go all the way to the back, raising the back by the neighbors, bringing the trucks, the box trucks. Now you got the garage doors open 24 seven and now that is even higher and towering over their property. I'd just like for clarification on that, please. I, I really hate to, to tell you this, but it's not a show. Please don't cap anymore. We're, we're, I know you're all happy and you all support one another and I support you too. We all are here to support one another, but we really don't need the clapping. Thank you. So uh, where the, the driveway exits Andover Street, the grades are exactly the same as they are now. Uh, for handicap purposes, we can't slope the driveway too steep in front of the office so people can park not slope the driveway. At that point, we slope back. So the driveway never rises. It, it starts at the grade at Andover Street and drops to the back of the building. And actually, because we're putting a basement here, the grades and the drop actually back drop a little bit more than they are now. So the grade hugs the, the road, hugs the side of the building and then wraps around the back and slopes down. And this area is actually a little bit lower than it is now. Pavement in this area is actually being removed. So actually, there's less impervious surface as you know, impervious surface, water runs off. If it's grass, the water soaks in. So we're actually reducing the amount of pavement on site, so there's more ways for the water to percolate. So we have less stormwater issues here because of the, of the development. Uh, the building is not higher than the existing building.
This is the roof line of the existing borders books. The existing borders book stops about here. The same roof line continues across the front of the building. There's no increase in height of the building at all. And we're maintaining the same setback from the street. So the new addition is the same distance from the street as the existing building. And we're maintaining the same 100 foot setback with the addition from the property line here. And uh, further, this use will generate a fraction, maybe a tenth as much traffic as the existing borders books would generate. So from a traffic point of view, this is actually a dramatic increase in safety versus the conditions that are currently on site because there's so little traffic here. And the loading dock is not, there is currently a loading dock back here for trucks to deliver books and supplies to the bookstore, that, which is being abandoned. This is not a loading dock. It's like a glass bar parting doors to a retail store. 90% of the traffic in here is people coming on off hours. So from a traffic point of view, it's even safer because it, it's not peak the same time people are commuting. People are coming here after work, off hours, are coming here weekends and evenings. So it's not contributing to the traffic generation problems here. So actually from a traffic point of view, it's a dramatic improvement over if another bookstore were to come here to operate, it's actually a, a, a big improvement of that. As far as lighting go, we can do whatever you like us to do. We, we want to just create enough light so it feels safe. It's not like a dark place where people are going to hang out. It's just for that purpose. It is completely fenced. So if you don't have a key code, you're not going to be able to get back here and hang out. This is a safer area. It's open parking lot. If it's a retail store, people can come back out here and drink. That's now not a possibility. It's completely fenced and closed off. And the lighting we can control, and if it's, we can reduce it, uh, shut it down in the evenings if, if that's necessary. So if you're standing here, if you're coming out on Loris Drive, and you're looking uh, along, your visibility is not impact at all. Even there's some big trees out here. I mean, we love trees, but if that's uh, an issue for you, we would happily take and clear this as much as you like to make sure your sight lines are improved. So there's no elevation change. So that we are simply grading down this entire parking lot here is going to be removed. It can be planted. Uh, okay, so le I, I would just like to reiterate some of your concerns. The height of the building and, and just correct me if I'm wrong. I just want to make sure that everybody gets this. The height of the building stays the same. The back setback is the same. The front setback is the same. The and what was the other thing I wrote? Lighting. So perhaps if lighting is going to be an issue to the neighbors at some point that could be discussed or finalized, you know, make them happy. Yeah. And, and, and I do have a, I, I have a question. I, I don't usually go up that area at night, but with the cars that are, there are cars still stored there now? Is that correct? Are there cars? There's not, is it empty now? Oh, it's completed. Well, there were cars up until when? Okay, so four or five months ago, was that entire area with, with cars, was that lit? So when the cars were there, did the, any of that lighting bother you as neighbors? Under the sp uh, special permit, the lights were off at 10 p.m. every single night. I didn't ask you that. Did okay. it bother you? Of course it bothered us. As soon as it's dark out, it lights your house up like a fishbowl. It's... Go ahead. May, may I just, um, quickly regarding, you are saying that it's the same as the existing building, the new addition, but the existing building does not abut the properties. It's off to the back side by 128, by the off-ramp for 128. The addition that you're asking for literally abuts the four properties. And, all, and you say that it's not a loading dock, but how are people loading their stuff? Are they pulling their car into the building to load? Right, so it is a loading dock in that location. They have to unload their car 
outside on the premise to then bring it into the building. So it is a loading dock no matter which way you want to look at it. No, I understand. Understandable, but it is still people showing up. One home moving could show up with seven cars if you're saying they don't want to use a U-Haul. Seven cars for one storage unit, 780 storage units. Or they could have a diesel engine U-Haul arrive to unload at 1 a.m. Excuse you also me, you're, you're really honest to God, you're talking to us, not, not to him. He, oh, he's okay. there for, for clarification. So also, what I'd like to add is you're saying He's stating that people are coming after work, coming weekends. That's the only time we're home. <laughs> we work too. So the majority of your customers are arriving during the time that we want to relax or sit in our backyards that we love. If I can just um, comment on that. I thoroughly understand. Um, if it were still border books, open till 10 p.m., you'd still have lighting, cars, uh, people going to buy books in and out of the, till, till 10 o'clock at night. This is 24-7. This is not till 10 p.m. as the special permit allows. This is 24-7. And any time the lights are left on overnight, I have that's, to... That's not us. That's the council. Understandable. Understandable. The building itself is too large. At the end of the day, you care about the size and the variance that they're requesting. The building is too large for the current zoning. It's too large. It's... Then what are you asking for? We, we have not triggered lot coverage. We have not triggered height. We have not triggered anything but... Uh, but essentially trying to uh, position this new addition in essentially the exact same footprint that was allowed by that special permit. And so we're a continuation of that. We don't get any closer to our neighbors. We don't get any closer to the street. We don't get, we do to the extent that the addition uh, it heads to the uh, west. We do get closer to Loris Road. I'm asking for the setback that is existing that was already granted. But that's not what the, that's not what the zone is for. You're asking for that building because that's what that building is. But the setbacks allow for further away from the back property and the front of 114. And if I could just point, point out one last Oh, I think we're all familiar with the area. We've, we're, we've, lived here, we've lived here for many, many years. But, but wasn't that building border books? And it's been there. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter. We're not here. For You're right. Just Go ahead. The chair, Go ahead. It's, Go ahead. Uh, just, just through the chair. Yes, I, I'm not trying to be rude or disrespectful. I, I, I can understand your position. But we are the zoning board. We're here for dimensional relief only. So what's before us is should we or should we not grant a variance for the 30-foot setback versus a 50-foot setback in the front? In the front. Um, so it's, I mean, I guess there, that raises the question of the issue for Attorney Kelty and his clients. If you set this back 50 feet, is it as aesthetically pleasing? No. Um, is, it, is, it, is it as easy to construct? No, but you don't need a variance. If, if, if I could, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm Suze King, I'm with BL Companies as well, I'm the civil engineer, uh, and just that intersection will obviously be designed in order to meet state high requirement, requirements for the setback there, and so I mean, I, under, I understand the point, but it will be designed per standard uh, sight lines.
Anybody else in opposition? Hi, my name is Cindy Olenzenski. I live, we live at 24 Reynolds Road in Peabody. Um, I just have a couple of concerns um, in agreement with our, my neighborhood, um, but I also wanted to just bring to the attention of the zoning board, and I have a question about the construction of this building. Um, you know, what is the timeline in terms of the building? I'm also concerned about the noise pollution. I'm not sure if the zoning board and the company realizes that we're in the middle of a large state highway project right now where we are wedged between 114 and 128, and currently 128 is undergoing construction. So they're widening the highway, they're widening the ramp right where our neighborhood is. So we already are exposed to a great deal of noise pollution. Um, and that has is a major contributor, you know, we hear it throughout the night, it's during the night, it's during the day. Um, so my concern is with this addition of that building that that is going to increase the already loud construction that is happening in our, in our neighborhood. Um, so that's another concern um, that I bring forth. And the, the second uh, thing is, I'm not sure, I just might need a clarification. There was a mention about moving the, the entrance into the the parking lot. I'm not sure if you're keeping that entrance or if the plan was to to move it. Um, if it's if it's closer to Loris Road, um, you know that that is a concern. Is the safety uh, having lived there? That that is a concern. So so I am in agreement with uh, my neighborhood, but I also would like to raise those two points. I'm Al Gralia from 5 Reynolds Road, lived there for 28 years. I agree with all my neighbors and stuff, but we're here just for the zoning. We don't need to be hearing about all this other stuff because it's got to go through you first. So if you make the decision, then we go from that point on. I'm hoping you go with the neighborhood right now, but like the, all the other stuff is, has nothing to do right now. We got to go through the zoning and get that, whether you deny it or what. So thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Fred Tobin. I live at 12 Tammy Lane. And uh, we already have one storage area, and this has nothing to do with the project on 114. Between the construction on the North Shore Shopping Center, what's going to be happening on 128 in this, it's becoming an industrial area where we live. And I believe the valuations of our house are going to go down. And I just think this is going to be an eyesore. Anybody else in opposition? My name is Mary Murphy. I live at 10 Tammy Lane. I am further... And then take it off. I can talk loud. My name is Mary Murphy, 10 Tammy Lane in Peabody. I live further away from, I live on the opposite end of the neighborhood. My concern is 780 units. My concern is potential safety issues coming into the neighborhood. It's a quiet neighborhood. There are a lot of small children, small children in this neighborhood. There's a park down the end of the street. Swings, slides, sandboxes. I'm concerned of the safety element when you propose to have seven, you could have 780 individuals plus roaming around in that neighborhood at any given hour. That's my concern. Just one last thing. It's just to reiterate, we are here for the zoning. It should not be approved, in my opinion, in our opinion. Um, and if they are to approve it, they will be right along our property line, a residential neighborhood, residential homes. So again, we ask that you consider that and how that would affect our lives on everyday basis. 
to the chair, if I could, um, just to answer a few things. This is zoned BR. Perfect. BR is business residential. It takes into consideration neighborhoods, and it takes into consideration businesses. For the gentleman who said this is becoming an industrial area, absolutely. Who lives by the shopping center wouldn't think it was going to become a commercial area. But the zoning does recognize the neighborhood. I'm kind of surprised that through my experience that anybody who comes before you to the council or the zoning board in an issue that involves Loris, Reynolds, or any road up there hasn't had a neighborhood meeting before they even show up at the board. Mr. Kelly's made many concessions. Probably one of the easiest guys I've ever had to approach. Very honest, very open, very willing to listen. You bring, gentlemen, when any opposition comes up, the first thing you say, we can do anything you want. Well, why wasn't this all discussed before you even showed up at this meeting? This is what BR means, business residential. Yeah, we want to encourage business uses. There's no doubt about that. We like to increase the commercial tax rate, right? but we also recognize the neighborhoods. And that's great. I'm glad you're here. But this should be done. I would love for you to show up and say, hey, we just can't come to any agreement and make a decision. It'd be very easy that way. But when you come to a place where there's opposition, and we know there's going to be opposition about things that we have nothing to do with. Sometimes you have no choice but to come to us because it's not going to go to the council again. This is the only bite of the apple you're going to get. But in this case, no matter what we decide, it's going to go to the council, just by the nature of the existing special permit. But I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't want to vote on this until you have an opportunity to get together and, and try to work these things out. Mr. Soper was right. I don't, under, I, I don't understand why it's being done this way. Why can't they? move some of the operations to the front of the building as opposed to the back of the building. We can do anything you want. But which way is it? Is there a common ground here? Can we make the building a little bit smaller? I don't know. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I don't want to make a decision on this. It's going to go to the council. I'll be honest with the residents. It doesn't look that bad to me. Those limited setbacks from a Zoning Board of Appeals point of view but if you look at the zoning, the intent of BR is to try for the businesses and the residents to get together and come to some common ground and some agreement. If you can't do that, that's fine. I'll gladly make a decision. But until you live up to the, to the intent of the BR district, I don't want to. I will. You want to go forward tonight? We'll take a vote. But I'd love to offer it up to say, hey, Let's give a chance to get this thing worked out. Maybe there's common ground there, maybe there's not. If there's not, we'll make a vote. Uh, Thomas Gould, 9 Abington Avenue. I would like to take uh, Mr. Osborne's advice and see if we can get the neighbors and Attorney Kelty and the uh, storage facility people together. Uh, if you'd like us to do that, we'd be more than willing. Council Matsoulis is ill and he'll be out for a while, so I'll be acting on this behalf. If that's the way you'd like to go, we'll be glad to do that. Attorney Kelty? Attorney Kelty, are you okay to do that? To continue, and uh, we'll see if we can get a neighborhood meeting together. So if that's the way you'd like us to go, we'll do that. I know the neighbors, uh, we still have, as Mr. Osborne said, we still have the big bite at the apple through the council, and as you can see, there are many people opposed to this, so, but would, would be willing to get together and discuss it. I believe, I, I hope I shouldn't speak for you folks, but uh, I should speak for you folks, I should say. So that's what we'd like to do if that's okay. Make a motion that it be. Yeah, oh, Attorney right. Kelty. I think Attorney Kelty. Um, Mr. Kelly has said that we could have that meeting at the building, so if we'd like to uh, pick a date, we could do that right now. 
Pardon? Yes. Okay. So I would respectfully uh, request that this matter uh, be continued until your uh, next regularly scheduled meeting, which is February. Motion to continue this hearing till February 24th. In favor? Aye. Any opposed? We'll see you together, please. Uh, motion to approve the minutes from last meeting. Second. 